What do Falcons do? We rise up. Welcome to Rise Up Reactions, the show where we talk all things Falcons, NFL, Georgia sports, and in general, the sports news of the day. I'm your host, Dr. Lee Denning, the Golden Hard Dog, and a lifelong sports fan. And guys, I am finishing up my summer series on the uh, predictions for all of the divisions in the NFL. We are concluding with what I think is the most competitive, the hardest division in the entire NFL this year, and that is the AFC North. The AFC North has four teams in it that always brutalize each other. You had the Ravens last year who ended up with the top seed. You ended up with um, Lamar Jackson getting the MVP out of them. You have Joe Burrow in this division who got hurt last year and had he not been hurt I could have found them easily two to three games better making the playoffs. You have the Cleveland Browns who Deshaun Watson, whatever's going on with him, sometimes he's good, sometimes he's not but they have a stellar defense and then you have the Pittsburgh Steelers who have not had a losing season in the Mike Tomlin era. And I don't know that that continues this year, but I can't pick against it. It's like a, it's almost the most sure bet in all of sports right now is that he continues to have winning seasons, though I do think that could change this year. But without further ado, let's jump into this. As always, we're going to say one thing first. All of these teams are going to play every team in the AFC West. One team is really tough to beat. One is kind of plus or minus, and the other two, I think, will be easy wins for most of the teams in this division, although certainly there will be stumbles along the way. They all play the NFC East. Similar story. You have two really hard teams in the Cowboys and Eagles, and then you have a wild card type team in the um, in the Washington Commies that I have no idea what they are, and then you have the Giants, who I think are better but still going to be bad overall. Uh, so probably a win for a lot of these teams there. And then you have one opponent based on how they finished last year in the NFC South. And as always, uh, each team will play other opponents in the AFC and the other two divisions that they're not all playing head to head. Uh, and they will play who they finish or play the same team that finished the, the way they did last season. So without further ado, let's jump into this. And it's just the way that it turned out. This is kind of interesting. Uh, but we're going to start out with the Ravens. And I picked this the way that I'm talking about these guys because on NFL.com it's easier to kind of follow along with acquisitions and departures for this team uh, based on how they rank them out and list them. But it's, we'll we'll have something fun to say about it at the end here. The Ravens finished 13 and four last year, best record in the NFL particularly in the AFC. Uh, they are losing Mike McDonald as their defensive coordinator and bringing on Zach Orr, so it's going to be a little bit different look for them on defense. Their offense is probably going to be clicking about the same as it did, though they are going to be changing significantly what they have in the backfield. A lot of their longtime guys have gone now. But let's talk about their additions real quick. Let's talk about Derek Henry coming in. That is the biggest signing that they had. Uh, and then you also have uh, Justin uh, Matabuike coming on. He re-signed a four-year deal. Big deal for him. You've got a couple of wide receivers and Nelson Aguilar uh, as an extension and Deontay Hardy as a one-year deal. Nothing really crazy there. Brent Urban, Chris Board, Malik Harrison, Arthur Mollett, uh, just you know, you got some re-signings and signings within there, so keeping some of the team together. You do have some notable departures here, and again, I they lost four running backs. They lost guys that have been a part of this team for a long time. Two of them to the Chargers, but you lost Dalvin Cook and Melvin Gordon, who have kind of been recent add-ons, both of whom have a historical good track record, neither of whom have been good lately. Uh, then you also have J.K. Dobbins and Gus Edwards, who have been on the team basically their entire careers, who are both moving on to the Chargers. You're losing Odell Beckham Jr., you're losing Devin DuBernay, going to the Jaguars, you're losing Laquan Treadwell, a guy who got hurt in college and never really lived up to his um, to his potential. You're losing Morgan Moses off the offensive line, losing Josh Simpson and Kevin Zeitler, uh, also losing Sam Mustafer to the Broncos at center, Jadavian Clowney gone at edge, uh, Tyus Bow uh, Bowser, Delshawn Phillips, Patrick freaking Queen, a guy who I wish the Falcons had drafted back in that draft, but they didn't. You're losing Rockyson, you're losing Geno Stone, Daryl Worley, Tyler Ott as your long snapper. Ton of losses for this team. You are getting some notable additions uh, in the uh, draft, though. You're getting Nate Wiggins out of Clemson in the first round. Uh, Roger Rosengarten as an offensive tackle out of Washington had a pretty good year with the Huskies. And then you're getting Adisa Isaac out of Penn State as a linebacker. And you have a handful of day three picks to mix in there as well. Rasheen, Rasheen Ali as a running back may end up seeing time because, again, they don't really have anybody left in that running back room besides 
Derrick Henry, who's getting older, who will have one of the better teams, maybe one of the best teams he's ever played with, but is getting older. He's still going to be a beast, but I would look for this rookie to get a little bit of work here as a relief guy and maybe end up coming out on his own. He comes from Marshall, so I don't know as much about him, but I'm just looking at what they've actually got on the roster, and they didn't fill the running back position in free agency other than Henry, so we'll see what happens there. They're unique opponents. They have to go to Tampa. They ha- and that's going to be in October, so it's not going to be a particularly hot game. You're going to go to the Bill, or you get the Bills at home in September, and you have to go to the Texans later on in the year. So not the easiest schedule there. And in addition, they have a fairly brutal opening here. They open at the Chiefs in Week One. I uh, get the Raiders as kind of a who cares game uh, to, in week two. Then you have to go to the Cowboys week three. You get the Bills at home in week four, and you have to go to the Bengals in week five. That's a brutal stretch. And I honestly do think they could be two and three or three and two. I don't think they're going to be four and one or better at the end of that stretch. I think they're going to beat the Raiders, and they might they might beat two of those teams. I think they're the better team or will be the better team in a couple of those matchups, but it's going to be really tough. Ultimately, when I look at this team, I do see 12 and five as their ceiling. I don't think schedule alone. I don't think you can reach the heights that you reached last year. You're probably going to go four and two in the division just because I think the Bengals are good. And I think you will lose to either the Steelers or the Browns somewhere along the way. I don't think I don't think you go three and three, but I could see a world where every team in this division goes three and three in the division. But ultimately, I do think that they end up going four and two in this division, and that twelve and five is their best chances. Uh, best chance. There's a world where I'm looking at this and thinking, God, do they lose all of these tough games? Does something just not go their way? And there is a world where I could see them going nine and eight. That would be the absolute floor. I and that is if they get everything going wrong for them. If injuries happen, I'm assuming that Lamar Jackson stays healthy, but if Derrick Henry's not healthy, if something happens that way, they just don't have the depth, if they don't have the wide receiver help, that could definitely be a factor here. So ultimately, I do think 9-8 and is their floor. I have them finishing 11-6, and and we'll see. That's going to be an interesting finish in this division. We're going to go on, though, next to the Bengals, who finished 9-8 and last year in spite of everything. Losing Joe Burrow midway through the year, still finished 9-8. and Now, they also have a fair bit of departures that we need to talk about. The Bengals are losing a ton of guys, or or some key players, rather. They are losing Joe Mixon. He was traded to the Texans, been a staple since he was drafted for, oh gosh, it feels like six or seven years ago now. Tyler Boyd is gone. He's with the Titans now. Uh, you're missing Irv Smith at tight end. Not that that's a huge loss. Jonah Williams at offensive tackle going to the Cardinals. He's been a staple for him for a while. DJ Reader, defensive lineman, going to the Lions. Uh, and then uh, Awuzie going to the Titans at corner. And then Scott uh, Nick Scott going to the Panthers at safety. So some key guys that played a lot of snaps for them last year are gone. And one of the safety blankets is now gone for, um, for, uh, for their team as well, and Tyler Boyd. But they did have some notable additions. Zach Moss, when he has been given bell cow work, has been good in Indianapolis. He is now on a two-year deal at the Bengals or with the Bengals, so I think that's beneficial for him. They did put the franchise tag on T. Higgins, and as of the making of this video, and things can change, this is June, he does not have a contract yet figured out with the team for long term, so we'll see if he holds out or does anything. They did bring in Trenton Irwin as a re-sign. Mike Isicki is signing a one-year deal. I think that's an upgrade. It will tie it in from what they've had so far. They re-signed Drew Sample. Again, not a huge deal there. Bringing in Trent Brown um, to uh, to sign a one-year deal. Cody Ford, Sheldon Rankins, uh, Davis Gaither uh, re-signed as well. Von Bell is probably one of their bigger signings at safety. Uh, And then you get Geno Stone as well signing a two-year deal at the safety position. So they did a decent bit to bring some people in in free agency. They bring they bring in Marius Mims out of Georgia at offensive tackle. He is going to be very, very good for them. I think he was probably one of the better tackles in this draft. He just ended up being drafted, I think, about the fourth or fifth tackle in this draft. Um, and I think he probably could be top three overall. Uh, you're getting Chris Jenkins out of Michigan, who played a big and pivotal role for them in their national championship run. Jermaine Burton, former Georgia guy, coming in at wide receiver, uh, coming out of Alabama. He had a couple of good years with them after he transferred. I think it was dumb that he transferred for the reasons that he chose because he would have ended up being targeted massively 
by uh, by Stetson Bennett and the rest of the Georgia quarterbacks. He would have been one of their favorite targets, but he, you know, it wasn't meant to be. And then McKinley Jackson out of Texas A&M coming in at defensive tackle as well. You get a handful of day two picks that I don't think are necessarily worthwhile to talk about, but we're going to move on from there. They do have some tough games as well, but ultimately their schedule is a little bit easier because of how they finished last year. They get all the same opponents, but they also get the Patriots in week one. They have to go to the Panthers, and they have to go to the Titans in December. I don't think they necessarily lose any of those, uh, especially if you have Joe Burrow and he's healthy. Ultimately, I think they're one of the better teams in the division. I have their ceiling also being 12-5. and five. This is going to be a race between the Ravens and the Bengals. It's going to be a race. It's going to be 12-5 and five is their ceiling. 9-8 and eight is also their floor, and I have them also finishing 11-6. and six. But because of division record and because of head-to-heads, I do have them finishing second in the division. I do have the Ravens beating them out. Then we're going to go on to the Browns, who finished 11-6, and six, I would say overperforming after losing Nick Chubb early in the season and having to play with a backup quarterback for a significant amount of time with some injury to their $65 million per year all-guaranteed contract to – uh, to Deshaun Watson, you know, guy who really loves that shoulder, you know, ends up with a shoulder injury, really love to get that shoulder worked out and in, uh, in massaging, apparently, uh, among other things. But the Browns, they are losing a, a handful of guys here. They are losing Jeff Driscoll, Joe Flacco, and P.J. Walker. So basically all of their backup quarterbacks that they had last year are gone. They're losing uh, Kareem Hunt, uh, Marquise Goodwin, Nick Harris at center, uh, Jordan Elliott, defensive lineman to the 49ers. Uh, Anthony Walker to the Dolphins. Mike Ford to the Texans at corner. Uh, and then they had some notable additions here. They did bring in Tyler Huntley and Jameis Winston to be backups to Deshaun Watson. Um, I don't know that this makes them the only – I don't know exactly if this makes them this, but I think they may be one of the only all people of color – uh, quarterback rooms in the NFL now, which is kind of cool. They are bringing in Deonta Foreman, which makes sense to back up Nick Chubb, assuming he's back and healthy. Naheem Hines as well. I think both of those are solid signings. One of their bigger signings, they get Jerry Judy with a trade with the Broncos. Uh, that should beef up um, uh, their wide receiver room, and I think they will have a better year giving Amari Cooper somebody to basically lean on, or rather Jerry Judy can lean on his success, and both of them should be good. Zadarius Smith re-signed, got an extension with the team. Uh, Jermaine Effetti signed with the team at offensive lineman. You get uh, Shelby Harris, Maurice Hurst, Quentin Jefferson all on the defensive line. Devin Bush being one of their big acquisitions from Tampa Bay. Uh, and then you get Jordan Hicks as well coming in. Uh, you get Tony Brown at corner, Rodney McLeod Jr., Cade York, and Corey Borog. I can't say this guy's name. It's a punter. Nobody cares. So, Team that finished 11 6 last year. Their unique opponents are at the Jags week two. That'll be a little tough. At the Saints in November. That's always a tough game because if you've ever been to New Orleans, you will understand that that is an environment that is harsh to anybody that goes there. And then they also have to play the Dolphins at home in December. I actually think they're going to win that one because the Dolphins haven't proven it to me as a cold weather team. They still did not have a ton of draft capital here, uh, taking Michael Hall Jr. in the second round. Again, they're still feeling the effects of the Deshaun Watson trade. Uh, Zach Zinter, uh, off, uh, guard out of Michigan. And then they didn't have any picks until late in day three. So they didn't really add a whole lot in the draft. This is a team that probably will be very similar to how they finished last year. I don't know that they end up making the playoffs. I actually have done that already, and I'll talk about that video on Monday as I talk about my playoff predictions and Super Bowl predictions based on how I have done all of the divisions. But ultimately, this is a team that I still think will be good, and if all things go their way, I think 11-6 and six is their ceiling. I don't think they win the division, but I think they have the potential to. Um, I do see a world where things go poorly for them, and they end up finishing as 7-10 and 10 as the floor. Ultimately, though, 10-7 and 7 seems like a good landing spot for them. That's what I ultimately think they're going to end up doing when I went through everything. Um, they do get offensive coordinator Ken Dorsey, so we'll see what happens with that. But, yeah, ultimately 10-7, and 7, which is going to be good enough for either third or fourth in the division. And then let's talk about the team that has continued to have winning records but has been 3-8 and eight in playoff appearances since uh, their Super Bowl run. I think it's since their Super Bowl run. Maybe it's in the entire career of their um, of their uh, their head coach. But you have the Steelers. They finished ten to seven last year. They made a bum headed move in bringing in Arthur Smith, an offensive coordinator. Week one is going to be a big week. They go to the Falcons. It's going to be kind of a revenge game for Arthur Smith, and they also brought on a ton of guys from the Falcons. 
uh, former offense, which I'm not overly concerned about, but I could end up eating those words after week one. But let's talk about the guys that they're losing. They're losing Kenny Pickett, Mason Rudolph, Mitchell Trubisky. Basically, they lost every quarterback on their dang roster. They are all gone, and they have favored bringing in Russell Wilson on a basically one-year prove-it deal where Denver is basically paying all the money and they're giving him a veteran minimum, and they trade Kenny Pickett to the Eagles after just two years. I don't know that I love that move, but Kenny Pickett, I think, would be a good quarterback on a number of teams that had some support. But, again, just he's not ever going to be an elite quarterback, I don't think. So I don't blame them doing that. But they did also bring in Justin Fields, who I think is an upgrade to Kenny Pickett in terms of skill set. And he should sit for a year, at least half of the year, until Russell Wilson flames out and then gets a shot at it. They're also, they got rid of Deontay Johnson in a trade to the Panthers. Uh, Allen Robinson's gone to the Giants, not that he did a lot for them. Uh uh, Okora, Okorafor at offensive tackle going to the Patriots, losing Mason Cole at center, losing Marcus Golden at edge, Armand Watts going to the Patriots, Michael Walker, former Georgia guy, going to the Commanders, Quan Alexander leaving the team, Patrick Peterson leaving the team, Keanu Neal leaving the team. Really a lot of losses there, but they did bring in a ton of talent as well. Signed Kyle Allen to a one year deal as well. He's probably going to be the third string or practice squad uh, quarterback. Getting, and this is where I think it's funny. They're bringing in mostly Falcons players here. Van Jefferson, Scotty Miller, Cordell Patterson, Michael Pruitt. Some of the favorite weapons, or lack thereof, for Arthur Smith. He kept trying to feed Van Jefferson the ball, and Van Jefferson couldn't catch a single one of them. Scotty Miller was lost in the offense, never being utilized. Cordell Patterson... Had a solid start, but I do think age is starting to catch up with him. They have him listed as a wide receiver, but he's going to be a running back in that, uh, running back more or less. Then you have Michael Pruitt. He's a solid blocking tight end, but he was used a ton in our bad cap year as a receiver. And he's got some weapon, he's got some good potential to him, but he's not nearly as good as some of their other guys. I think Washington and uh, Fitzpatrick, I think that's his guys, the guys that I can't remember who their main tight end is all of a sudden. But I think they're both better than he is. Um, and then you have bringing in Dean Lowry, Patrick Queen on a huge deal coming over as an FU to the uh, Baltimore Ravens. Uh, Dante Jackson acquired in a trade with the Panthers. Cameron Sutton signing a one-year deal with the uh, with the, uh, the Steelers. So they're improving on defense overall, I think. And they still have TJ Watts as long as he's healthy. He's had some injury issues in the past. But ultimately, they also had an okay draft. They ended up dra- drafting Troy Fatanu, who I think is one of the better offensive linemen in this draft. He's listed as a guard, but he couldn't end up playing tackle. Zach Frazier brought in at center. Roman Wilson, wide receiver out of Michigan. I really like his game, but we'll see what ends up happening. They need to find another wide receiver that actually is going to be competent because the ones I did bring in I don't think are very competent. Uh, Peyton Wilson, linebacker out of NC State. I can't say that I know much about his game. And then a handful of other guys here, just a few more picks on day three. I don't know anything about their undrafted free agents, but a lot of those guys don't end up making the team. Their notable games are uh, unique opponents are at the Falcons week one. Again, that's kind of a revenge game for the uh, either for the Steelers or for the Falcons. I'm going to say it's a revenge game for the Falcons because, my God, Arthur Smith just absolutely destroyed our team last year. There is no reason in the world we shouldn't have been an 11-6 team last year. It A lot of that had to do with quarterback play, and a lot of it had to do with poor management by Arthur Smith. So I'm not going to lie. I'm staying away from all running backs in the Pittsburgh Steelers offense this year because I know that he doesn't know what the heck he is doing with them when he gets to the goal line. So we'll see. You should. I think you should invest in the tight ends for this team from a fantasy perspective because obviously he likes tight ends. But they also get the Colts week four. They have to go to the Colts for that one, and then they go to the Jets, or they get the Jets at home in week seven. That game will purely depend on if Aaron Rodgers is playing as to whether I think they're going to win that game or not. But ultimately, I do think they're going to struggle this year. I think they could go as good as 11-6 because, again, they've got better, theoretically, better quarterback better quarterback play than went 10-7 with that last year. But I do see a world where Russell Wilson goes back to two years ago, Russell Wilson. And Justin Fields can't figure out the offense with a guy who didn't even want to try to trade for him when he was with the Falcons. Didn't even want to try to attempt to get him onto the team. So I think you could have a struggle there. I think they could have some chemistry issues. I think their defense will be good, and they'll play in a lot of low-scoring games. But ultimately, I think their offense could could basically falter 
The worst I see them doing is 5-12. and 12. I don't see it being any lower than that, but it's pretty low. And again, I have thought this team was going to fall off a cliff for the last three years. They have not done so. And because they haven't done so, and until they prove otherwise, I've given them a winning record every year, though I do think that winning record is a 9-8 and eight record this year. That's the weakest team in the division. So ultimately, that ends up being a fairly tight division. 11-6 and six for the Ravens, 11-6 and six for the Bengals, 10-7 um, and seven for the Browns, and 9-8 and eight for the Steelers. So everybody wins, but we'll see how many of, the, of those teams make the playoffs. If you've been following along with me, you might be able to figure that out. But thank you for watching, liking, sharing, subscribing. My playoff predictor video will be out next week. Uh, thank you to all of you who have subscribed and continue to support my channel. I appreciate you guys. And as always, rise up.